maximal okay. recoverable dose. Yeah, I don't I know if it's referenced much, but it was definitely thrown around a lot at Edinburgh. I guess in the AFL, you probably you know lean towards that and potentially maybe we look at the minimum effective dose. But with all the research that you've done and obviously with your coach's experience, which way do you sort of lean towards? I wouldn't say I lean too far one way or the other because obviously coming in, they're very different sports and very different contexts in terms of type of athlete. The run demand here in AFL obviously takes priority and it takes a lot of the athlete's time and effort. There's probably space for minimum effective dosing within AFL. But also don't think that we should forget the physical adaptations and the neuromuscular capacities required within AFL. I think the scope to be smart and how you train and plan your S&C so that you're not kind of inducing additional fatigue that an athlete is not going to be able to recover from. Moving over into the sprinting aspect, can you explain the, the dose response uh, when it comes to your research in regards to yeah, sprint training for field-based athletes? The dose response terminology, I think it covers all aspects of S&C, right? We've done a, a kind of couple of papers around that. We did another fairly substantial meta-analysis with Brad Schoenfeld, my supervisor, in terms of modeling the changes in relation to load applied and other factors such as volume and frequency and the difference in intensities required to elicit different responses across outcomes, especially for these guys who aren't trained in the context of sprinting. They're sometimes not great movers. So kinetically, what can we do to improve their output? The things that stand out was training at higher intensities at 80% 1RM plus with improvements in the more strength side, resulting in the higher transference to improve sprint performance. What are some other sort of misunderstandings we have as an industry to get caught up in that aren't so effective? I think we do get caught up in training methods. A term I came across was training systems. So a system can involve a range of methods, but it's how they're applied and how they can be interpreted differently within different contexts. We can get caught up in everyone needs to squat, everyone needs to do X amount of sets and X amount of reps. And whereas in reality, that's just not the case, or I personally don't feel the case. This is probably something that I did take from Nick Lumley and that he was big on chasing adaptation. And I think that's something that's starting to evolve now. And that we're starting to realize that, especially team sport athletes, some of them just aren't built to barbell back squat. Like, let's not focus on I really want you to do that. Now it's like, all right, well, let's scrap that. You're able to leg press heavy or leg press fast. Are we going to stick some bands on it and we're going to make it move quick? We're going to do that because we're chasing lower body adaptation. What's some of your favorite strategies in terms of trying to still get that stimulus into them in the gym or with cross training? Yeah, I think there's obviously the low hanging fruits in terms of maintaining strength loading and we can do things like plyos and ballistics. If someone is really lacking in that space you can make use of resisted sled work and kind of banded work to kind of really still work on those capacities without going out on the field and doing rep after rep after rep it is challenging to change the shapes that a person makes but there's no harm in trying right especially in that gym center where you got a lot of one-on-one -on -one time let's really make a have a crack at making that athlete more efficient within a really safe space in terms of resisted sprinting and kind of horizontally based plyos kind of provide that acceleration stimulus in terms of decelerating. With that adaptation, what's some of your favourite ways to measure how your program is working for the athlete? So if they are, if it is leg press, is it just you know simply their ability to improve their strength on that leg press or are you using a different testing measure maybe on the force plates? Obviously, we, we, we jump every week as a kind of acute neuromuscular fatigue measure but it, it does also give us that kind of weekly insight into who's trending the wrong way over a long term as well as these kind of acute fluctuations for me simple metrics jump height peak power they're probably your key performance metrics along with tracking things like yeah load applied 